regulator or anyone uh, to not protect Reece New Zealand. Dyson. Mr Chairman, I'm really pleased to contribute in um, part five, which I think is misleadingly titled miscellaneous provisions, and I, I don't mean that it was deliberately misleading, but I think it would imply that it hasn't got a lot in it. And, and in fact, there's a huge amount of really important provisions in this part. It covers clauses 205 to 239, um, and while I don't want to focus most of my contribution on the last clause, um, I'd invite members to read clause 239, consequential amendments, and it just says amend the enactment specified in schedule three as set out in that schedule. Um, I, I looked at that schedule three, and Mr Chairman, it just goes on and on and on and on. And I'm quite um, surprised that there has been to the best of my knowledge, and I've been listening in the House to the debate, there has been very little, if any, debate on the raft of legislation that, is, that are described as consequential amendments under Clause uh, 239 set out in Schedule 3. So while I refer to that, and I might get back to it later, um, the main contribution that I'd like to make is in terms of both drafting and content in an area that my colleague Sue Moroni quite accurately predicted, and that's in clauses 211 and 212. These are the two um, areas dealing with health and safety at work, um, including the publishing of a strategy and workplace injury prevention. Uh, I want to ask about the drafting, first of all, and I, I know that the Minister and the Chair isn't responsible for any of this um, legislation, but as the Minister sitting in the chair, um, I'd encourage her to get advice from her competent officials and um, answer some of the questions that have been raised. It's really frustrating when you don't have the responsible Minister, but you do have um, legitimate questions that are unanswered. Sometimes Ministers just use their lack of portfolio responsibilities as an excuse, but I know that they could ask the uh, advisers for some contributions and be of assistance um, to the House as we go through this committee stage. This is our only opportunity as a committee of a whole to get answers about specific parts of the legislation which we're debating. Once we're through the committee stages, that opportunity is lost to us. So I would like to ask, in terms of the drafting precedents, Clause 212, Workplace Injury Prevention, describes two provisions, Section 264A, in sections 264B of an entirely different piece of legislation, the Accident Compensation Act 2001, and how that legislation requires WorkSafe and ACC at all times to have a workplace injury prevention action plan that meets the requirements of that section of another bill. Um, I don't recall uh, other legislation where within it is contained provisions that just say another act has this in it. It doesn't have any legislative requirements pertaining to the Health and Safety Reform Bill. It just says what's in another piece of, uh, what's in another act. And I want to know about the drafting precedence of that. We've been told that it's not consistent with modern drafting practice to, to refer to other bits of legislation that may be relevant. And to me, this seems to be inconsistent with that advice that I've heard discussed in the House previously. So that's my first question, not about the content, but about the drafting and what I think is unusual and not um, in keeping with parliamentary practice in 2015. The, the next point that I want to raise, um, Mr Chairman, is actually more specifically about the policy and the intent in clauses 211 and 212. Let's start with 211. It's uh, subtitled Health and Safety at Work Strategy, and it says in part two, the strategy must be developed jointly with WorkSafe. It doesn't say who it's developed jointly between, and one might assume that it, it refers to the minister, but nowhere in this clause is the minister required to develop a strategy. The minister's just required to publish a strategy and I think that leaves it up to the goodwill of the Minister to actually develop a strategy jointly with, with WorkSafe if that is in the intention. It might be jointly with ACC, it, you know, it might be jointly with any number of people, but it is not at all clear 
what 2112 means in terms of who the who the parties, Mr. Chairman, uh, the who the parties to the development of the strategy are. Uh, the, the minister should, in my view, lead the development of a strategy. I'm surprised that after seven long years, they haven't worked out that we used to have a workplace health and safety strategy. It was a robust strategy. It set a framework of action for government departments and agencies. I don't know what's happened to it. The minister probably didn't know it was in existence because this seems to be the first ever time that attention has been focused on the need for a strategic framework for government departments and agencies to work to. I'm concerned about um, part four in this clause, which says the minister may amend or replace the strategy at any time, which to me um, gives the minister powers that I think you know, may not necessarily be abused, but I think are not representative of the need for collaboration and understanding and commitment to the implementation of a strategy. Having a unilateral ability to amend or replace a strategy is not the way to get buy-in from employers and workers in New Zealand to the successful imp implementation of a strategy. And if there's anything that we've learnt through this committee process and, and listening to some of the contributions from the other side, sometimes I wonder if there were lessons learnt. But if we have learnt one thing, it's the need for people to understand and buy in and then commit to the implementation of ensuring that our workplaces are safe. Um, Mr Chairman, I just want to turn my attention now to the, um, to the provisions of injury prevention which are outlined in 2115B, which is um, ACC's injury prevention priorities, and again refer to um, Clause 212. I want to tell the um, Committee of the Whole a little story about two what I think um, were excellent injury prevention programmes. One is directly related to the provisions of in this legislation and one isn't, but I want to tell the House the story of it anyway, if I may. And the reason I say they were excellent um, injury prevention programmes is because th they were independently peer-reviewed in a robust fashion and found to be excellent. The first one was an older person's full prevention strategy. It was led by uh, good organisations throughout our country, uh, sometimes Presbyterian support, sometimes age concern, very simple programmes. And, and the peer review for that, the, the programme, of course, was designed to reduce the number of falls by older people. Otago University Injury Prevention Unit um, peer reviewed it and said that it was excellent, it was simple, it was accessible, it was free, and it was reducing the number of falls in, uh, that older people were inflicted in New Zealand. I think that sounds like a really good idea. When an older person falls and breaks their hip, they die a lot earlier than if they hadn't fallen and broken their hip. We know that is a fact. So if we can prevent falls that hurt people, cost the health system, and cause earlier death than otherwise would have occurred, we should do it. We should put government money into it. One of the first actions of the incoming national government in 2008 was to cut the funding for that programme. Another one which had exactly the same outcome, that is, excellent injury prevention outcomes but funding cut, was the health and safety training. Went to three levels. So introduction, second level, third level, uh, that was developed jointly be between the then Department of Labour, Occupational Health and Safety experts and ACC. Uh, workers from all over New Zealand were able to go to those courses and learn about making their workplace safer, not just for themselves, but for other people, and then go back to their workplace and pass on that knowledge. That is a great driver of a change in the culture of New Zealand workforce, and that's what we need. We need better education, better understanding, and leadership to drive a change of culture that will reduce the number of injuries, and again, one of the first actions of the incoming national government in 2008 was to cut the funding for those programmes. So they are no longer available, despite Clause 212 describing workplace injury prevention and explaining the requirement 
for WorkSafe and ACC to have at all times a workplace injury prevention action plan. You've got to back it with the resources. Kelvin Davis.